Hi, my name is Yiit Boyer, and I'm a technical lead on Android. Today, we'll talk about what is Navi Jetpack. Android Jetpack is a suite of libraries to help developers write high-quality apps more easily. These libraries help you follow best practices, free from writing boilerplate code, and accommodate your application across operating system versions so that you can focus on the code you care about. Since its launch, Jetpack has seen a high amount of adoption across many of the top Android applications. 47% of the top 1,000 apps use two or more Jetpack libraries, and that number doesn't even include core libraries like AppCompat or Lifecycle. We are excited about the growth we have seen and the incredible feedback we have received from the community. Thank you. We have done a lot of work over the past year. We have new libraries launching today that will make it easier to write better apps and we have also made major additions to existing libraries to expand their scope. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. First up, Hilt. Hilt is Jetpack's recommended dependency injection library. Dependency injection is a technique widely used in programming and well suited to Android development, where dependencies are provided to a class instead of the class thread in the itself. This helps reduce coupling in your code base. By using dependency injection, you get better code reusability due to decoupling between components, and testing becomes easier since your class dependencies are well defined. Moreover, in the latest Android developer benchmark survey, 49% of developers ask us to work on a dependency injection solution. So we have teamed up with the Dagger team to create Hilt. Dagger is a dependency injection library developed by Google and is widely adopted in the top Android apps. However, Getting started with Dagger on Android has a steep learning curve. Hence, we have created Hilt. Hilt is an opinionated dependency injection library specifically built for Android on top of Dagger. While using Hilt, you annotate your fragments with the Android entry point annotation, and Hilt will make them injectable. And now you can use the inject annotation to inject your dependencies. You can also use the Android entry point annotation in other Android components like activities or services. Finally, you need to annotate your application class with the Hilt Android app annotation so that Hilt can create the dependency graph for your application. Thanks to the tight integration between Jetpack libraries and Hilt, your Vue models can also be injected automatically. All you need to do is to annotate your Vue model constructor with the Vue model inject annotation, which tells Hilt to inject it. Because Hilt is designed for Android, it knows what a V model is, its scope, etc. So it does the right things by default. If you have a dependency you want to provide needs more manual setup, you can create a Dagger module with the installing annotation, and Hilt will discover it automatically. With installing, you can specify the scope of dependencies provided by your module. Hilt comes with predefined scopes for Android, so you don't need to define your own for the common cases. We have seen great results when we have integrated Hilt into our applications. We have replaced Dagger with Hilt in the Google I.O. application, and we were able to delete 75% of the dependency injection code. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it is true. Go check it out. Hilt not only reduces the code you need to write, but also reduces the mental load to get started. It also scales very well with your application, as is already used by major Google apps like YouTube. To recap, Hilt is the new recommended Jetpack dependency injection library. It's built on top of already proven Dagger. It has integrations with VM models, fragments, and work manager. It has well-defined scopes for Android. And my favorite part, it also has out-of-the-box testing APIs, so you can replace your dependencies per test with support for both integration and robo-electric tests. Last but not least, it has Android Studio integration for a more delightful developer experience is available as alpha today, and we have even created a cheat sheet for you to quickly get started. Check it out and let us know what you think. Next, another new library, App Startup. Performance is important for us. That's why today, we are also launching the alpha of our Android X Startup library. As you add more libraries to your application that wants to run some initialization code on App Startup, it has a negative impact on your launch performance. Most of these libraries use content providers to initialize automatically, including some Jetpack libraries like Work Manager and Lifecycle. We have analyzed the cost of creating content providers, 
and each of them adds at least 2 milliseconds on a Pixel 2 device running Android 10. This is just the cost of content providers, not the work library does. The App Startup library provides a straightforward and performant way to initialize components at application startup by avoiding a separate content provider for each library. Here's an example of an initializer component that configures Work Manager. It extends the initializer API specifying its type, and when create is called, it simply initializes Work Manager and returns the instance. Alternatively, the initializer component can also define its dependencies so that the startup library will initialize dependencies before initializing our component. Under the hood, the startup library uses a single content provider shared between all these initializers, reducing the application startup time. So the app startup library can be used by both application and library developers to streamline startup. It supports lazy initialization to further improve application startup performance by completely avoiding the content provider. It automatically adds trace points for every initializer. This way, you know the true cost of components being initialized at application launch using tools like Systrace and Perfetto. It's available as alpha today. Try it out and see how your app launch performance improves. Moving on to the Android Game SDK. To make game development easier, we have launched the Android Game SDK earlier this year. It includes a set of libraries that are designed to help you improve your game performance across devices. It has been available on the Android website and now is part of the Jetpack family and also available on Google's main repository. The SDK currently contains two important modules. The Frame Pacing API allows games to maintain a steady frame rate and can lower a game's input latency. The library detects the expected frame rate and auto adjusts frame presentation times accordingly. Android Performance Tuner enables you to measure and optimize frame rate at scale. By integrating it with your game, you get new performance insights in Android Vitals designed specifically for game developers. It's available as alpha on the Google Play memory repository. As you can see, performance is important for us. And we are not just focusing on game performance, but we are also investing in tools for application developers. Today, we have a new alpha release for the benchmarking library. It integrates with the CPU profiler so that you can profile your benchmarks and then weave the method or sample tracing right in Android Studio. We have also added support for memory allocation tracking so that you can optimize the time spent for allocations and reduce the load on garbage collection. Next, Paging3. Paging is a library that helps you load and display small chunks of data incrementally. Today, we are shipping Paging3, a complete rewrite of the library using Kotlin coroutines and adds highly requested features like separators. Here is how it looks. This is the heart of the paging where we connect it to our backend. We extend this paging source class, which is a single method that we need to implement. Here, we call our API to get the result and return the page. If something goes wrong, we return an error result to notify paging that an expected error has happened. Once you have the paging source, you can create a pager, provide it the configuration of our page size, and get the flow out of it. Finally, in the UI layer, we collect from this flow and pass the values into our paging adapter. The adapter will take care of displaying the data for us. To recap, paging is rewritten from the ground up with Kotlin coroutines and flow. It has built-in APIs that headers, footers, or separators. You can even do other transformations like mapping items or filtering them. It adds new APIs to observe the loading state and has methods to retry or refresh. Last but not least, Paging3 is fully backwards compatible with Paging2 to help you migrate easily. It is available as alpha now. Please check it out and let us know what you think. We're very excited about our first Kotlin Coroutines library. Let's move on to a library that I wish existed when I was working on apps, CameraX. Creating real-time filters six, seven years ago was not fun at all. CameraX is a Jetpack library that makes integrating camera into your application very easy and reliable. It reached beta last February, and we are focusing on reliability and better documentation before reaching the stable version. CameraX runs on 90% of Android devices, which means there is a lot of variety in terms of performance and feature set. To make sure Camera X works well, our test lab runs our automated test suite on both low end and high end devices that cover over 400 million active devices in use. 
This means you can spend more time on your application rather than accounting for different devices in your code base. Preview view is a widget that displays the camera preview in your application. It now handles interactions with your application lifecycle and view pages reliably. It's also optimized to transparently use surface view under the hood on devices that will benefit from its performance enhancements. This provides less buffering and better power efficiency. We are also focused on providing more guidance to make it easier to use camera X. We have added a sample for YUV to RGB conversion to do image analysis in a more familiar format so that you can easily integrate it with libraries like MRKit. We have created a lot of other samples as well, including OpenGL and rotation handling. So take a look at developer.android.com for more details. Next, Work Manager. Work Manager is the Jetpack library that allows you to run deferral background jobs, like sending a very important email when the user is connected to the internet. Here are some highlights from the 2.3 and 2.4 releases. Work Manager doesn't only rely on job scheduler to execute your jobs, it also has an in-process scheduler to run your workers, and we have greatly improved it this year. It now supports delayed workers and periodic work requests. The scheduler also no longer imposes scheduling limits, which improves the throughput of your work requests. Work Manager now supports long-running or important work that should be kept alive by the operating system. Here's an example of a worker that uses the Coritis API provided by Work Manager. When the worker starts, we can call the set foreground method with a notification to display to the user. Finally, we do the actual work and return as usual. Work Manager will take care of dismissing the service for us. Because we are using a foreground service, this worker can run longer than the usual 10 minute limit. Keep in mind though, this API requires you to show a notification to the user so use it sparingly. Let's look at another improvement to Work Manager, Diagnostics. Sometimes it's hard to know why a worker didn't run when you expected it to run. For those cases, we have added the new Diagnostics API that you can invoke via ADB to peek into the internal state of Work Manager. When invoked, Work Manager will dump its current state into Logcat, which we can simply view via an ADB Logcat command. As work managers adopted by applications, we have identified some common mistakes. We have added lint rules to cache these so that Studio can immediately inform you if that happens in your code base. Here is an example where we make the worker class private by mistake. If you do this, Studio will quickly warn you that the worker needs to be public. I mean, I know you don't write bugs, but this is for the other people watching the video. That was all with work manager. Let's talk about navigation. The navigation library allows you to navigate between different screens of your application with ease while also following Android UI principles. In navigation 2.3, we have added support for dynamic feature modules, which allows you to download pieces of your application as the user needs it. This can significantly reduce the initial download size of your application. Thanks to the integration with the navigation component, you can navigate to these modules as if they are part of your base APK. All you need to do is to annotate your fragments with the module name, and navigation library will take care of downloading it if necessary before moving to that screen. In addition, we have made lots of improvements to the deep linking feature in navigation. You can now access query parameters, provide custom actions, and specify MIME types. I remember writing deep linking support manually where you had to carry over information over multiple screens to go to the right place. That was no fun. With navigation, it is just one parameter in the graph and all is taken care of for me. I love it. And last but not least, my favorite new feature, returning a result. Let's take a look at it. In navigation 2.3, now each screen in your application has a nav backstack entry, which gives you access to the save state of that entry as well. To ensure your results are kept over configuration changes or process that, Navigation uses the save state handle class to pass data between screens. Your fragments can access the previous fragment save state handle by using the previous backstack entry. Once you obtain the save state handle from the previous entry, you can set the result values on the save state. To observe the result, you can get the same value from the save state of the current backstack entry and observe the value live data. This way, observation is lifecycle aware and because we are using save state, it works even if your application is restarted between these two screens. 
So that was the new result API in navigation. It's actually part of a bigger all whole of the APIs related to passing data between screens and applications. We know there have been many changes recently in terms of permissions on Android, and we wanted to make it easier. This new API, which we call Activity Result Contracts, makes asking for permissions super easy, as well as many other common tasks like taking a picture. Let's take a look at an example of how you can ask for permissions using the new Contracts API. First, we register for an activity result and specify that we want to use the request permission contract. We also need to provide a callback that will be called with the result of the permission request. Later, when we want to ask for the permission, all we need to do is to launch the function that was returned from register for activity result with the parameters. When it's resolved, it will call the callback we have provided. If you want to obtain multiple permissions at once, there is also a request multiple permissions contract that you can use. There are more contracts available like asking users to take a picture, query contents from a URI, or open documents. Check out the Activity Results Contracts API for more. On top of most popular library, AppCompat. AppCompat provides backports for a wide variety of UI elements and platform features from the material team to dark mode. Because some of the functionality from the framework is duplicated into AppCompat, it might be difficult to figure out which attribute you should use. To help you make most of the library, we have added a set of library-specific intros. For example, here's a layout I've used the drawable start attribute to set a drawable on the text view. If you open this code in Studio, it will immediately show you a warning and ask you to replace it with the more fully-featured version of the same attribute available in AppCompat. We have also made substantial improvements to AppCompat's implementation of the Duck team. And to make sure you can still customize your team, we have added a configurations override API. For instance, if you wanted to specify a custom locale for your activity, you can override the attach base context method and create a new configuration, which you can configure as you please. Afterwards, you should create a new context as a combination of the existing context plus the custom configuration. Finally, you should delegate to the super method so that you, the new context is used across the activity. Speaking of Duck team, Jetpack's WebKit library has a new API in 1.2.0 release to force dark mode for its contents. When enabled, the web wheel will render sites in Duck team where supported or forcibly invert certain colors if the website doesn't support dark mode. Wow, we have covered a lot in this video. These are just some of the highlights that we think you should know about. But that's not even everything. There is more in our What is New in Android Jetpack blog post. You will find links to documentation, samples, and other features that we weren't able to cover today. We are excited to hear more from you and what you think on these new APIs. Try them out and take advantage of the best of Jetpack. Thank you.